Putin, given that he's in charge of a major nuclear superpower, is doing what the hell he likes, conducting diplomatic visits to North Korea. What's extraordinary about this, if you ask me, is the sheer volume of events they've managed to pack into one day. After we've watched this rather light-hearted piece of propaganda, after we've questioned the nature of pageantry, we'll get into the reality of this ongoing and escalating conflict and what might be likely to bring about an end to it. Because the problem is precisely this. Russia have relationships with North Korea. They have, curiously and perhaps now given this improving relationship with North Korea, relationships with China. They have a powerful economy. They're part potentially of the... Is it BRICS? Is it BRICS? That alternative set of global currencies that could bring down the dollar? It seems to me that what's happening at an ulterior level is a challenge for a unipolar world, or whether or not there can be separate power bases in Russia, the United States, China, or God, get this, more and more decentralized nodes so that all of us have more access and control over the institutions that affect our own lives rather than allowing this sort of casual drift towards a unipolar, globalist, corporatist world in order that we're safe and protected. Let's enjoy for a moment Putin and Kim Jong-un driving around together. I'm quite curious to see that Vladimir Putin is actually driving himself. <laughs> looks quite nice, Kim Jong-un, when you see him out of context. In fact, I'm not even sure what the social issues are in North Korea that we're meant to care about. Here they are having their own military parades. I reckon it's Kim Jong himself who came up with the idea of having kids with balloons. <laughs> Pageantry is about power, whether it's the coronation of King Charles or the inauguration of a new power. It's a ceremonial demonstration of a state or nation's ability to assert its own will, its own might and its own story upon the world. North Korea, I suppose, is by definition isolationist. America at the moment is going through a revival of isolationism. You're an American, are you? Don't you feel more and more that you just like to focus on domestic issues, domestic infrastructure, stay out of foreign wars, focus on supporting the people that are in America, protect America. What about what's happening in my country, the UK? Increasingly, it seems like the UK doesn't want to be part of Europe. Of course, there's ongoing conversations about Brexit and whether Brexit was executed correctly or whether Brexit was the correct thing to do. But more and more, when I speak to people, actual people, <laughs> actual people, I mean people that aren't caught up in media and professional urbane classes, it seems that what people really want to do is get on and live their own lives without the ongoing fear that they're going to have either state or corporate intervention in their own lives, that the rules are going to change around them, that there's going to be less economic opportunity, less ability to have sovereignty and control in your own individual life. When you see this, this is North Korea doing their thing. This is them saying, we're a country, we're doing our shit, and we've got our own relationship with Russia. It's not just North Korea are the baddies or Russia is the baddies or even the UK is the baddie or God, let's take it even further. Any particular political party or individual within them is either good or evil as and it says. And I continually remind you that the line between good and evil runs not between nation states, religions, creeds or even Korea, but through every human heart. It's not South Korea good, like top soccer stars populating the world and North Korea bad with that adorable man toddler leading it. It's a complex thing. And Russia continued to assert their own dominance and their own political will upon the world. And they can't be stopped. What I enjoy is actually seeing how it's propagandized and how it's sort of sentimentalized. Do you think that this is a 
This is a kind of demonstration of masterful editing. Surely Putin and Kim Jong-un aren't waving to each other quite as enthusiastically as this viral video suggests. Pretty sentimental stuff. I can't imagine that they're waving that many times. There's an Observer story. Now, as you know, the Observer is a legacy media organisation and as such will find various ways of carrying the message that the establishment wants you to hear. They are indeed, as we discussed when talking about the theme tune to this very show, sending the government's letters right to you to ensure that you stay on point and correctly propagandised. Here's their take on Putin Putin's visit to North Korea. Here we go. So he talked about Putin's visit to North Korea and Vietnam, and it caused a lot of consternation, writes the uh, Guardian, uh, but this, I believe, is in The Observer, which is a subset of the same legacy media outlet, among Western powers, which was undoubtedly his intention. The Russian president is keen to demonstrate that notwithstanding the widespread condemnation of his illegal full-scale invasion of Ukraine and the ensuing diplomatic ostracism and sanctions, he still has international support and can raise the cost to his opponents of continued backing for Kiev. If anyone doubted the extent to which the war in Ukraine has become a truly global issue, here was conclusive proof of its almost universal impact. Putin and North Korea's dictator Kim Jong-un signed a mutual defence treaty that commits each country to provide military assistance to the other with all means at its disposal in the event of the attack. The treaty represents a significant boost for Kim's isolated regime and for Putin's efforts with China to build up an anti-democratic, anti-Western international alliance. How dare you! How dare you! You. How dare you have a treaty? We can't continue to bring you this beautiful content without the support of our partners. Did you know that Americans are absolutely full of excretia? And Americans have more colon rectal disease than any other human group anywhere on the planet. That is because you don't eat enough fiber. You're glugging down the milk. You're glugging down the meats. You're not getting no fiber in your diet. Yoga, weights, cardio, every exercise and sport are negatively impacted. That is why you need Dr. Schultz's intestinal formula number one. Do you know what it does? It promotes regular bowel movement. Dr. Schultz is going to make your poop into your dupe, your rube. You will be in control. You've got to take Dr. Schultz's intestinal formula Number one, visit herbdoc.com forward slash brand for 25% off the product. You'll be better at sport. You'll be sleeping better. Visit herbdoc.com forward slash brand, 25% off. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to kiss the sky. Oh, that won't work. Oh, that's not a good one. Might I ask, what is the sole basis for NATO intervention into the Ukraine-Russia conflict? Do you, whatever the complexities of this situation might be, believe anywhere, in any iota, in any modicum, in any cell of your being, that NATO and the military-industrial complex are doing this because they care about Ukrainian people, Ukrainian buildings, Ukrainian children? Or do you imagine that whatever treaty is being enacted in order to facilitate the supply of weapons that are being used now on Russian territory, do you imagine that it's humanitarian? Do you imagine that open border policy is about humanitarianism? Do you imagine that their policies in COVID were about humanitarianism? Have you got any part of you left, any inkling, any thread, any tendril, any synapse that isn't filled with dread every time one of these bureaucracies says we've got a plan to help you. I know you're doing that Reagan quote right now. I'm from the government. I'm here to help. The nine most terrifying words in the English language or however many it is. The simple truth is North Korea and Russia can have a treaty if they want to. In the same way, I suppose, that the United States of America and Ukraine can have a treaty. The same way that Zelensky can crop up at the Golden Globes and say, thank Thank you, BlackRock. Thank you, Goldman Sachs. Keep funding this war. American taxpayers, peace out. To attract attention and have cooperation with such giants of the international financial and investment 
world as BlackRock, JP Morgan, and Golden Sachs. That is an extraordinary use of soft power meets military power. And indeed, it becomes clear over the course of the evolving conversation around the attacks on the beach in Crimea that Russia are fully well aware that it takes American military expertise to continue these attacks. While we are glibly supporting, or maybe I'll take some responsibility for myself, opposing this war and all current conflicts that we are involved in in any way. We should consider that Russia and many of the people affected by these wars don't see it as a kind of, oh, you know, let's just put a flag in the bio and just breezily support some issue, wave some flag from another land and just hope that history will understand. Because what we're engaging in, in all honesty, in all seriousness, is increasingly beginning to resemble the scenarios that preceded both of the world wars in the last century. And my personal horror is this, that the people that lead us believe that their power can withstand global conflict and in fact will be enhanced by it. If you consider that a health crisis and an economic crisis for the majority of people led to a wealth transfer, increased power for the elites that govern, for want of a better phrase, do you not think that in the same shady cadres where those decisions were cooked up, what's that event, event 19? Do you not imagine that by now they're beginning to consider, well, we got our Hawaiian bunkers, baby. We'll live through it. We'll be fine. Don't you imagine that they're already beginning to believe that a nuclear war for them is not the same as a nuclear war for you? The treaty represents a significant boost for Kim's isolated regime and for Putin's efforts with China to build up an anti-democratic, anti-Western international alliance. Just again, just remind you that elections are suspended in Ukraine. I'll just remind you that even in your country, my country, all our countries, the power of big tech to manipulate and control narratives is such that you can't really claim democracy in our countries anymore. Is it really democracy as intended by the Greeks or by the founding fathers? And I know what you're saying, Republic, Republic. I hear you, I hear you, I see your comments. Do you really think that their intention was a couple of barely distinguishable parties controlled by the same undergirding squabbling in a leather bound oak clad room claiming that it's on behalf of ordinary people. Is that the intention? Is that the point these days? The deal directly contradicted Russia's past support for UN Security Council sanctions intended to rein Pyongyang's proliferating regionally destabilizing nuclear weapons and missiles programs. Putin links such mooted arms supplies to Western arms supplies to Ukraine and in particular Biden administration's recent decision to allow its longer range missiles to be used by Kiev to hit targets inside Russia. As usual, Putin claims to be acting in response to provocative Western actions when in reality it is he who's doing the escalating. There's no doubt who bears the primary responsibility for this destructive spiral. The country that believes it's okay to invade another's sovereign territory. I just wonder how the writer of that article would contend with CIA intervention in the 2014 maiden coup, the use of US made weapons in Russian territory, the various CIA bases across Ukraine, the numerous pledges that have been broken. Let's start with the main one that when the Berlin Wall came down and Germany was reunified, it was agreed between the United States of America and the Soviet Union. Union, that there would be no impeding upon former Soviet territories. That's the big one. Again and again, Russia have been provoked. I'm not apologising for Russia. I've got no interest. Well, I've got interest in Russia. I think it sort of sounds like an amazing place, actually. But I'm not shilling for Russia. If I'm shilling or grifting for anything, it's peace. These developments again underline the urgent need for an end to the Ukraine crisis with its ubiquitous negative ramifications. One man, the same man who triggered it, could halt it today if he so chose. By refusing to do so, unscrupulously, infinitely reckless Putin proved again last week that he is global public enemy number one. That is old school propaganda there. Think about how The Guardian would review this show. That that's a brand was shilling American insurance. He was selling Rumble's coffee. They're so haughty and hateful and loathing of the ordinary men and women of American malls, of the ordinary men and women of British streets. There's so much loathing. They so strongly detest ordinary people. They're so confident and certain in their views. They're saying that Putin is solely and singularly and totally responsible for that conflict. Putin is the person that's saying, don't let Ukraine join NATO. 
This shit's over already. The territories that we've reclaimed are ours. So we are funding a... Do you want to call it a squabble? It's a costly and mortal, terrible squabble over land and territory, costing Ukrainian lives and Russian lives. For what? For what? Who benefits? All you have to do is watch me by all means, but watch Jeffrey Sachs or John Mearsheimer or watch any of the many experts that will pellucidly inform you of history, not opinions, history and what has led to these events. And you will understand that what legacy media give you is propaganda. That even in the ridiculous spectacle of Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un parading, quite literally around releasing children's balloons, all you're watching is their version of what we do all the time. And wouldn't it be easier for all of us if we were able to break out of our own heads and for a moment understand, as Edward Said famously wrote in Orientalism, that we have different perspectives and different views, all of us. You might believe that one culture is superior to another, another civilization is superior to another. You might have all sorts of views. But unless you believe in absolute authoritarianism, you're going to have to believe in other people's rights to run their own countries and their own communities. And, you know, heaven forbid, not be democratic, particularly if the country that you're living in doesn't support dem democracy through freedom of speech, freedom of ideas, freedom to disagree with one another, freedom to have political and cultural affiliations that are outside of the rather static and homogenous cultural ideas. They're increasingly gaining dominance in all of our societies. But that's just what I think. Let me know what you think in the comments. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to see more uncensored content where free speech can flourish, join our live stream. Click the link right here to watch the next video if you want to, or become a member of a growing movement. Download the Rumble app and you'll be informed every time we make a new piece of content. Stay free.